on legitimate forms of sexual fulfillment, <laughs> structure of the family, and the number of other issues. These differences often have cultural origins and are bound up with the cultural identity of their bearers. Human beings, now I would have, I want to argue that, human, that cultural identity, certainly within certain limits, deserves to be respected for several reasons. Human beings are not only generic beings or members of the human species, but they are also culturally embedded and heirs to particular cultural and religious traditions, which act as a moral compass in their lives and as sources of meaning and significance. Not that these cultures are, not that they are imprisoned within their culture and cannot revise and reject it, but rather than even when they reject it, they do so by embracing another and cannot live in a transcendental, culture-free realm altogether. Given the fact that human beings are both cultural and human, respect for them requires respect both for their humanity and for, their, uh, for the culture within which they are embedded. There are also other reasons for respecting people's cultural identity. Cultural identity adds to the resource, to the uh, richness of collective life, expands our range of uh, choices, expands the range of imagination by generating new ideas and new insights into our common problems. Respecting cultural identity also makes people feel valued, removes or attenuates their sense of anxiety, and both nurtures their sense of commitment to the wider society and facilitates their integration into it. This means that both social cohesion and cultural differences, both unity and diversity, make claims on us. We need unity in society, but not of a kind that suppresses or mocks identity, because such unity will remain inherently fragile. And equally, we should value diversity, but not of a kind, or in a manner that undermines or weakens unity, because an unstable and insecure society lacks the confidence to, re to respect and live with differences. We discuss this question of balancing unity and diversity at length in our report. This is how we formulated the problem. How can we create a Britain in which the spirit of civil partnership, civic partnership, shared identity and common belonging goes hand in hand with respect for diversity? Or, in another formulation, we said, is it possible to reimagine Britain as a nation in a multicultural way? I am convinced that the answer that we gave in the report is substantially correct. And I want to go through some of the points that we made in the report and which I'll be prepared to defend. Our answer to the question, how can we imagine Britain as a nation in a multicultural way, was as follows. Over the centuries, Britain has developed a democratic structure and is held together by allegiance to its legal and political institutions. These institutions make it the kind of country it is and constitutes its uh, focus, the focus of its collective life. Basic loyalty to Britain, or at least acceptance of these institutions, is the sine qua non of citizenship and constitutes a basic obligation on all its citizens. There are certain values which, are, which have long been or have increasingly become an integral part of British society. These values are normatively binding, not because they are ours, because many of our values on critical reflection might turn out to be discriminatory or unacceptable. <laughs> These values that obtain are normatively binding because we can give good reasons for them. And we can show why these values should be respected by all, or if not by all, certainly why we have decided to respect them in our society. These include such values as mutual respect, tolerance, peaceful resolution of differences, equality of human worth, racial and gender equality, and individual liberty and free speech. These values help us decide the range of permissible diversity. Those practices of the, of the minority communities or even the majority community that violate them are suspect 
And depending on the gravity uh, of their violation of these values, they might be discouraged or even banned altogether. For example, arranged marriages are allowed, but not forced marriages, because they violate the important value of individual equality and liberty. The permissible range of diversity also informs the application of common laws and values. For example, no marriage is valid if it is entered into under duress. But what is duress? What constitutes duress in one cultural community might not be so in another. Or in law, we talk about individual sense of agency or responsibility. But how do you determine an individual sense of responsibility and what are its limits? In a community, for example, where women have been conditioned to act uh, in a very obedient and obsequious manner, a woman who is asked to carry drugs might be forgiven, uh, whereas uh, in another society she might not be. On the ground, the, the nature of agency and the limits of agency are culturally sh shaped and therefore have to be defined in a culturally sensitive manner. In other words, equal treatment may, under certain circumstances, involve different or differential treatment without being discriminatory. In our report, we also went on to argue that public institutions enjoy popular legitimacy and moral authority and discharge their functions more effectively when they, re when they reflect social diversity. Minority presence in public institutions is important, not for its own sake, but because it enables them to identify with those institutions and allows those institutions to represent a wide variety of views and experiences. Therefore, for example, it is right that political parties, civil service, parliament, the judiciary need to examine their procedure, their language, their assumptions to see if they contain biases that might work against certain groups. We saw that recently when the number of MPs standing at 13 in 1997, just before our report was written, rose to 27 in, in 2010, simply because political parties, especially the conservatives, began to look at their procedures and decided to revise them because they were found to be prejudicial to the minorities. The plurality of, uh, the, the, this is the vision of Britain that we advocated, recognition of cultural differences and political space being opened up to accommodate minorities uh, and uh, to enable them to interact with each other and with a wider society. This pluralist or multicultural vision of Britain has a liberal thrust, but it also widens and deepens liberalism so as to make it more hospitable to cultural differences than it has traditionally, than has traditionally been the case. Multiculturalism, mm -hmm. as we defined it, and here we enter into controversial territories, but uh, that's exactly what I want to do, because the report was intended to be controversial. Multiculturalism, as we defined and, and, and explained in the report, which is what I have just outlined, is not open to the criticism that have frequently, or that are being frequently made of it. It does not, for example, imply cultural relativism or an attitude of moral laissez-faire or anything goes in the name of culture because it recognizes the constraints of common values that each culture should meet. It doesn't imply cultural ghettoization either. It doesn't mean that each culture lives within its own bounds. Rather, it encourages intercultural dialogue and seeks to foster a climate in which every cultural community feels relaxed and confident enough to interact with others and help evolve a rich and internally differentiated common culture. Again, multiculturalism does not mean fragmentation of society. In fact, the opposite. Because the idea behind is to ease the transition of a minority or diffident cultures and facilitate their integration into the wider society. Nor is multiculturalism excessively preoccupied or obsessed with culture, with or cultural issues, because we need equality of opportunity and equality of life chances if different cultural communities are going to engage in equal interaction and help redefine their common identity. This view of multiculturalism that we uh, outlined in the report is not our invention or is not a matter of what philosophers call stipulative definition. 
It builds on the tradition of discourse, post-war discourse, which was initiated by Roy Jenkins in his famous definition of integration, where he said the integration doesn't mean turning out carbon copies of somebody's imaginary Englishman.